Hello everyone. Welcome to Austin Wednesdays. This is our second edition um, and we're still working out just how to do it, but we're um, we're here in Chawton. I'm here in Chawton uh, today and I'm really delighted to be uh, recording an interview with the extraordinary Hilary Davidson, who is the most wonderful dress historian and who has written um, the seminal text on uh, Regency dress history. This is Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. Um, and it's come out this year. And it is packed full of information, uh, just really telling the story of what clothes were like in the Regency period, Jane Austen's relationship with clothing. Um, Jane Austen loved clothes. She loved fashion. She loved shopping. She was a brilliant uh, seamstress, brilliant needlewoman. Um, and she really enjoyed clothes. And there's so much to learn about clothing in her novels, in her letters. Um, and also the more you know about the dress and the history of fashion in the time, the more you get out of the novel. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, so we're going to go straight into an interview, which I've just recorded with Hilary in the house, although um, for health and safety reasons, we did it via Zoom. So we're in, in different rooms in the house uh, but talking to each other um, on Zoom. And then we're also, uh, stay with us to the end because then we're going to go straight into uh, a little clip, a sort of 10, 15 minutes, um, which I think we're really lucky to have with Hilary directly in the house. And she's really going to do sort of a bit of a deep dive into um, the, the sort of the history and all of her extraordinary knowledge about Jane Austen's police coat which is the only um the only known surviving piece of dress that is believed to have belonged to Jane Austen um, and it's actually a, a project that she a couple of years ago recreated the police so we have a replica of it here at the museum and she's going to really sort of explore that in some depth with us while you're here I just want to say um thank you so much for joining us and watching these videos with us if you enjoy them please do consider donating to the house um we don't we don't want to be asking you for money all the time but we are in um really serious circumstances at the moment and every penny helps so if you enjoy these if you are tuning in every month um to learn about Austin with us then please do consider a donation if you can we completely understand that that isn't possible for everyone at the moment um but without further ado i am really delighted to uh to introduce hillary davidson here we go hello everyone welcome to austin wednesdays this is our second edition and we are absolutely thrilled to be joined not only on zoom but on site in chawton um by the really wonderful hillary davidson who is the most fantastic dress historian and she has come here to see us all the way from Australia. Just kidding, but she is actually here on site in Chawton, which is really exciting. Um, so for health and safety reasons, we have, um, we're having a Zoom uh, from across the courtyard. So Hilary's in the historic kitchen and I am squeezed into um, a little sort of ante room. I think I'm basically in, in the larder really. Um, so we're gonna, be having, <laughs> we're gonna be having a conversation about all things, um, costume and dress because Hilary is the author of this fantastic book Dress in the Age of Jane Austen which has come out very recently this year um, and I've just got a million questions for you Hilary um, but I thought that we'd begin maybe with um, sort of the background to this project because this book is really it's just such a sort of amazing resource for anyone who's interested in dress in the Regency period and in Austen's novels and in, in Austen's life um and i wondered what it was that made you want to write it what was it that kick-started that process and when was it how long have you been writing this well thank you first of all Sophie. thank you so much for having me here i love coming to the jane austen's house and being here so it's an absolute delight to um, be here and be able to speak thank you very much uh, so what got me into Regency dress, and it was a bit of a surprise to me, but I used to live and work in Hampshire. And when I was here, I was asked to make a recreation of Jane Austen's pelisse, a kind of coat dress that is held in the Hampshire collections. And it was when I was researching for that, I sort of realised that 
there wasn't that much out there on Regency dress. I mean, there's there's huge amounts of resources, but I sort of I couldn't find the book on Regency dress. And the more I went on with this, um, and the more I became involved in kind of Regency clothing through the perspective of Jane Austen, because I started with her, with her body and her her dress, then um, I kind of more I got more information about Regency clothing. But this book has a very specific genesis, which is I was filming uh, up at Chawton House, just up the road, in January 2013 for the BBC documentary Pride and Prejudice Having a Ball. I was the dress consultant for that. And I was standing with uh, Professor Aileen Rivero, who is one of the great lights of dress history. And we were talking about Regency dress, and she said, it's really funny that there's no good book on Regency dress. And I went, actually, you're right. Why is there no, no good book on Regency? dress and she said I think you'd be the perfect person to write one and I said well that's very very kind of you and thought no more of it but six months later that little germ of an idea had been working in my head and I went you know what I'm going to do it so I put in a book proposal in October 2013 and I worked on it ever since so six years. So I've made, I've sort of working my way through the book with all sorts of things to ask you about um, and we've got some audience questions too that we've um, gleaned on social over the last few days so I'm going to scatter those throughout but I thought we'd start maybe with um, a little quote from your introduction and you say her works are synonymous with fashions of the Regency period awash with high waists heaving bosoms and cutaway coats and I think for so many of us who have grown up on Jane Austen period dramas you know that is really synonymous with what we think of as Austen fashion. But is that true? I mean, in a in give us it in a sentence. Are we right? Is that right? Or is Regency fashion, is that not quite quite what it is at all? It's the core of Regency fashion, but like any fashion, you have to adopt it to how people live. Everybody gets up in the morning and does something to their body. They put clothing on. And for Regency people, it wasn't a costume. It was how they got about their daily lives. So Yes, those things are the template of Regency dress, but what I was really interested in is how they lived in those clothes and what the clothes did for them, how they facilitated their way of living um, beyond just, you know, romping across fields and striding manfully of, you know, into, into rooms. Uh, so that kind of the, the intersection between our vision of Regency and how they would have experienced it was something that really interested me. I think... Um at first glance they don't tell us all that much about what the characters are wearing she doesn't go into too much detail about what what characters dresses are like or she just sort of gives you a, a very general picture so were the novels themselves actually very useful to you in doing your research or could could you glean details out of them that the lay reader doesn't pick up on Definitely. I mined the novels for absolutely every reference I could get for textiles and dress and shopping and fashion and beauty and even the way people mm, use their clothes. You know, there's there's oblique references that once, once you start to unpack them, you realise they're actually about clothing. So there's a bit in um, Northanger Abbey where Mrs Allen talks about uh, carriages open carriages are very, um, you know, inconvenient because you can't keep your clothes clean for five minutes in them. And that just opens up a whole world of, of course, you've got open carriages, you've got horses, you've got unpaved roads with dirt. And once you start extrapolating what that would do to your nice white muslin gown, just that little reference gives a whole insight. Um, and I could start reading the references that Austin does make to clothing have incredibly complex sort of cultural resonances. Um, I'm going to get a whole academic article out of Colonel Brandon's flannel waistcoat in Sense and Sensibility. That set me off. If you have read the book, you'll know flannel underwear features heavily in it, and it all came from this one reference to Colonel Brandon's flannel waistcoat. So tiny things like that, or the way that the description of Mrs. Elton in Emma, her purple and gold reticule, ridicule, sorry, this is really key, she uses the word ridicule, not reticule, is actually, it encapsulates Mrs. Elton's entire character in a four-word description of a fashion accessory. So there's all these little bits and pieces, it's not just what characters are wearing, but what clothing does in their lives. 
and what the making and production and thinking about everything to do with dress and textiles, how it operates. Um, there's some really subtle references in there. And I tell you what, having read them with, you know, a fine tooth comb, for every little detail, I'm just even more impressed by Austin's genius. Once I realised what she was doing with clothes, yeah, it, boundless admiration for her. Yeah, detailed observation, <laughs> but then having that sort of hidden, not, not making loads of it, but just sort of hiding it in there. So These little oblique references that if you know, you know, and if you don't, she doesn't mind, she just, just passes. Yeah, yeah, it's there for you if you're going to get it. So you just mentioned the little white muslin dress, and I think we've got to talk about that because it's so synonymous with Jane Austen. Everyone thinks of the high waist, the empire waist, and the white muslin. So, I mean, tell me about that. Is it is it um, really about symbolism, or is that really something... Was it a fashion because it was kind of standing for purity and virginity? I mean, what? where did that come from? Well, there's a lot of discussion about this. And in fact, a whole new book has come out on um, fashion of the 1790s when it starts to transform into this kind of white cotton um, mode. And there's lots of discussions about why these influences came through and why it became so popular. Um, discussions about the influence of classical style, about the influence of a new democratic approaches coming out of France post-revolution, uh, the availability and desirability of muslin or even cotton clothing, um, its, it's washability, um, kind of breaking with the past. But at a certain point, it becomes fashion. And there's a big difference between thinking about, you know, the symbolic idea of what you're putting on your body and just going, I'm wearing a white muslin gown because they're fashionable and I like them and everyone else is wearing them as well. So there's always that interconnection between sort of the concepts of fashion, what we can analyse as fashion and, hey, I like it, it's a pretty frock. So that's that's kind of going on there as well. I um, still feel I haven't quite got to the bottom of some of the influences for the white muslin frock. I'm very interested in period references I've found that suggest that India was a huge influence as well, which makes sense because you've got white muslin coming from India and a whole lot of high-waisted gowns there as well. So I'd like to kind of go down that rabbit hole. Um, so while a lot has been written about why the white muslin dress became so popular, I think it's really a confluence of influences that just hit the spot and kind of encapsulated modernity and change and the way fashion feels right at a certain time around that turn of the 19th century. Yeah. What I find fascinating is the idea that the fashion that they hit on and that they really sort of embraced is so impractical. So it's like the last thing you'd wear if you have any issues around keeping your clothes clean, if washing is a bit of a problem, then white muslin just does not seem like what you'd go for. But maybe that is part of it. Maybe that shows your, your wealth and status that you can afford to wear something that's white that can get dirty and you just have another one. Well, this is one of the things that is kind of hidden in the white muslin gown, although it's often positive, posited as this idea of a, an opposition to kind of aristocratic expensive silks, it does require a lot of labour to keep clean. So you have to be middle class or above to be able to either afford the leisure to wash the gowns yourself or more, more often have people wash them for you. Yeah. So the idea of white muslin gown is democratic is really, it's a bit of, you know, Marie Antoinette playing shepherdesses again, but it's it's not actually that democratic. Uh, there's a bit in Pride and Prejudice where Lydia Bennett in a, in a letter says, you know, get the maid to mend a great slit in my worked muslin gown. I mean, there's probably a double entendre there, but yeah, the maid's going to repair this very delicate, fragile fabric. But the, I think the idea of the muslin dress also so much encapsulates our idea of, of Regency fashion, but they weren't worn all the time. Like a day, you could might wear them in the morning at home, but to go out visiting, you, you might put on a nicer one, but they're often evening wear as well. So sitting, you know, working in a kitchen like this one, something more like the print cotton dress that you have, uh, have behind me, that's what people would have been getting round in more every day. They were kind of slightly more special. It's not like everybody was waltzing around in this very fine, delicate, very terrible, very um, dirtyable clothing yeah. as well. It's kind of, it, it's emblematic, but it wasn't quite, you know, quite so universally prevalent um, as yeah. we might imagine. 
that makes sense. One of our audience questions again. So this one is about modesty and it kind of ties into that a little bit, I think. So this is a question about how women maintained their modesty in the period um, and what that meant. And there's a lovely quote in the book where you talk about how visible shoulder blades and upper arms could constitute scandalous female nakedness, which I just love as, as a sentence. Um, but that's really interesting that different parts of the body, like your upper arm could be visible, but the lower arm couldn't, that had to be covered. That's so interesting. It's sort of like we think about when people complain about what's visible in bodies, and it's usually female bodies, and people have complained about this throughout history. and. One of the great ironies about this is it often tells us more about fashion. When people complain about fashion, it tells us about fashion. Um, so the ideas of nakedness, you have to kind of put them in context. Fashion had recently been, you know, very dense and far more structured. So when you can start to see things through the body, or if you're extremely low cut all the way around, or especially the complaints about what was visible at the back, that's new body parts that hadn't, hadn't been seen before. And for a long time, women's gowns stopped at the elbow. So as soon as you start creeping up here and you're showing the upper arm, that's, you know, it's revealing and it's doing so really quickly. It's like when the miniskirt came in in the 1960s. It's like, whoop, women have got thighs. Women have suddenly got upper arms. So it becomes, you know, their concepts of nakedness and what seems more naked have to be taken in contrast with what came before. Um, so, you know, what would sort of seem normal to us now, like what's revealed in a T-shirt, counted often as, you know, being very revealing in the period. Yeah, different parts of the body being surprising, breaking the mold, and then it takes a little bit of time for society to get used to that and adjust to it. And then obviously fashion is going to push another boundary and like try again. And I guess that that's something to do with what fashion is maybe, is it's to do with always being a bit ahead of the curve and being a bit daring and maybe fashion fashion isn't what really real women were wearing in their everyday lives. I always think of, I always call myself a dress historian because dress encompasses everything that we do to our bodies to adorn it, including haircuts and tattoos and piercings and space suits and everything. But fashion, I always think of as this kind of, it's a subset of dress. And I always think of it as their kind of, as you say, exactly pushing the boundaries and fashion makes the space bigger for dress to follow and to fall into and where fashion goes dress becomes and it kind of absorbs what fashion does until it becomes normative and you know then eventually old-fashioned and out of style but it always just gets absorbed into this wider world of dress but it is as you say it pushes the boundary and it's that change that leading change edge that there is a difference between fashion and dress and we all have all our dress has a relationship with fashion but it's not necessarily fashion yeah, exactly. So I've got another, I'm sorry, I keep on just quoting your own book at you, but I've got another, no, it's great. I... <laughs> which I really love. And I think this is so interesting. So you're talking about how, in fact, this is a quote that you are quoting from a lady of distinction. Um, and they said, in our days, a woman has the extensive privilege of arraying herself in whatever garb may best suit her fancy or figure. And I just thought that was so interesting because I think for so many of us today, we think about Austin, we have a very specific idea of what those characters are wearing, what people in that period are wearing. And I think my personal theory is that it's down to the costume dramas and the adaptations have been feeding us this kind of very similar look again and again and again. It's this kind of BBC Pride and Prejudice, BBC costume drama style that we see again and again and again. And it's the white muslin gown, it's the empire waist, it's the you know very pretty flimsy, Print, printed cotton. So I'm really intrigued by this idea that a primary source is saying women are so lucky you, they can wear really whatever they want. And I mean, is that, do you think that's true? It's, again, it's kind of within that broader template. Like, sure, they can wear whatever they want, but you try wearing a low-waisted gown in, in 1810, you're going to look hopelessly old-fashioned. So the What's really interesting about the Regency period is, although there's been a lot of external influences in fashion and sort of experimentation and fantasy happening in fashion throughout the later 18th century, what you really get in the Regency period is an explosion of what we're going to, about to call romantic influences. So you've had this kind of classical um, style, which 
as other scholars have pointed out, is really a kind of a romantic impulse. It's a romantic nostalgia about the past that gets reworked. And then as the Napoleonic Wars unfold, even from the late 1790s with the Egyptian campaign, you get this new influx of news from foreign places and depictions of, you know, dashing soldiers in incredible uniforms fighting in exotic places that have exotic people in them. So you get this kind of I want to say global, but um, it's pushing a little bit, but sort of a broader inspiration from fashion, from war, from travel. Um, and then you also start getting, as romanticism really picks up, romanticising history. So all of those kind of Gothic novels that um, Northanger Abbey plays off, they are re re-establishing the past in kind of mistier and more romantic terms. So you get this influence of history coming in as well. And for a lot of the Regency commentators on fashion, this was often a problem. You know, women are dressing like janissaries and hussars and, and, you know, not like English women at all. But it's also a kind of almost like fancy dress. They're taking all of these elements and just incorporating them. And if you want to wear an Algerian cap with a water blue, Waterloo blue jacket and then a pair of Spanish gloves and, uh, you know, on a pair of Egyptian brown boots you can and there's this sort of sense of fantastical experimentation which to our eyes now we perhaps just see as fashion or fashion plates or just part of it but to them it's a kind of there's um there's a possibility of incorporating fancy into dress and even the kind of romanticization of soldiers or military wear in women's dress has a huge influence. There's there's lots of kind of women dressing up in the feminine version of hussar costume, you know, I've got a hussar cap and a hussar pelisse and I'm just gonna rock that down the street. So I I just feel this is kind of great gleeful absorbing and experimenting with new influences that counts as this kind of anything is possible as a fashion influence, but I still wouldn't be doing it in a low waist dress. You still have to know how long sleeves are and, as Austin says a couple of times, whether long sleeves are allowed for evening and whether your dress is appropriate for, you know, the dinner that you're at or the visit that you're making. So always tempered with the kind of the, the social norms, especially for Austin's kind of middle class milieu that's sort of stuck between not being able to be too much in fashion but also not being able to be out of fashion, this kind of uneasy middle ground of respectability and taste. Yeah. yeah. There are some basics, like where your waistline is or where your neckline is, and you can't really play with those. Those are non-negotiable if you're going to be fashionable. That's really fascinating. You can you can be, if you're fa fashionable and ultra-fashionable, you can absolutely mess around with that, but it generally takes money or position and or notoriety or all three. So the kind of, the, the women who can get away with, being flamboyant, extravagant, and pushing the boundaries and be praised for it rather than censured for it. I mean, look at what happens with Mrs. Elton in, in Emma. She's pushing the boundaries of fashion and it does not come out well. That's what happens in the local sphere. You know, whatever they're doing in London, that's one thing. But in the local sphere, it's it's a bit too much. Yes. It always has to be a step down, doesn't it? Things that you can wear in London, very high fashion, very odd, strange ensembles that you're pulling together that are inspired from all sorts of different influences. Probably in your country village, you're in Highbury or you're, in, you know, you're in Meryton. People are going to look at that a little bit more askance. They're not going to quite know where you're exactly. coming from. Yeah, so, it, it must be, it's fashion tempered by taste, always with the sense of, you know, taste and what suits you. This comes out again and again and again in the sources is that, you know, you have to know what's in fashion, but don't, don't be a slave to it. Don't, you know, don't let the tyrant fashion just dictate what you wear. You've got to exercise judgment. So if we think about um, great places to look. As, as a sort of modern day audience, as a sort of voyeur of that time period. If we're thinking about things like um, costume dramas and adaptations, where are you looking for the kind of the really great examples? What do you think is a great adaptation? And actually we've got, a, we've got an audience question about this, which is about which is your favorite, very specifically, your favorite dress in an Austin adaptation? And, and why is that? What, what do you think is, is just brilliant? Oh, okay. Well, that's that's an interesting question. Um, my personal favourite overall Austen adaptation is the 1995 Persuasion. I just think that's stunning. Uh, 
But the, my personal favourite for the costuming is the recent Emma, the, the 2020 Emma, which interestingly has the same costume designer, um, Alexandra Byrne, who just did an extraordinary job. Well, I think the recent Emma is the best costumed Austen adaptation that's ever been made. And there's a lot of small details in that that I really like. Um, I can't think of a specific dress that really stands out from the adaptations overall, but one of the details that I loved that they did in Emma that you never see on screen is they used a slip, a coloured slip, to change her outer muslin gown. And this is a really clever tactic that they had because one of the properties of muslin being slightly transparent, women started exploiting this and they would wear coloured petticoats underneath. Uh, so, you know, yellow or pink or blue or orange, and then either a gown made out of gauze or net or tulle or of muslin went over that. And it's, it gives this beautiful, subtle pastel effect, as well as being a quite sensible way of sort of changing your wardrobe, but without too much cost. So they do that in Emma. She wears the same gown with a pink slip and then a blue slip. And I just think it's the most wonderful detail. And the fact that she also shows that women didn't wear underpants. Um, there's a, a beautiful fashion uh, engraving called Comfort that has a woman hoiking up her skirt with her naked bottom against the fire. And they replicate that as well as, you know, things like the dressing scene for Mr. Knightley, just all of these details about clothing that, you can tell the director relished, and I so enjoyed watching um, in the new Emma. So, yeah, that's that, that kind of detail of the modularity of Regency clothing is my favourite use of Regency dress on screen. I guess that that's just more representative of what the Regency period was doing. They loved strong colours and bold patterns, and they were quite daring in their style choices. And actually maybe we're actually thinking about them through a kind of Victorianized gaze that makes us think that they were a bit quieter and more subdued than they really were. It can be one of the wonderful things about working with historic dress and doing the research is finding the things that surprise you. I mean, certainly a lot of gowns were the kind of the, the pale cottons and things like this, but even if you look at the fashion plates, they accessorise them with really punchy colours and they're inventing a whole lot of new colours. I mean, the whole, the colour spectrum that gets inspired by, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, for example, is, is fantastic. And all of these kinds of vivid colours that were entirely achievable with natural dyes. You know, you could wear a white muslin gown, but then you have a buttercup yellow spencer and bonnet and handkerchief and gloves and shoes, and you're kind of, you know, just accessorising. We tend to see this a little bit more in the adaptations. So uh, I think of the BBC Pride and Prejudice in, say, the Bingley Sisters. So they get more colour and a bit more punch because of that fashionability. But even when you look at the prints on day dresses, they can often be sort of really quite cheerful colours or have, you know, dark brown backgrounds or turkey red. There's a lot more kind of variety and cheerfulness than these sort of, you know, pallid neoclassical ladies floating around damp Hampshire. Um, so just thinking about something that you said about how in the recent production of Emma, she's wearing, um, they use the same gown with a different, um, a different colour underneath. And there was something in the book that I thought was so interesting, how you talk about how in the Regency period, people had fewer clothes. So people could be identified by what they were wearing. And, and in a way their clothes became kind of synonymous with their bodies and their person. And I was just thinking, it's so interesting thinking about that in the sort of reflection of how we think about clothes now and how in our society so many people sort of think that you you shouldn't wear things more than once or you don't want to be seen to be wearing something more than once certainly if you know if you're a member of the royal family and you come out wearing the same thing twice the press really pick up on that and it's so interesting that in the regency period actually they thought about it so differently and it wasn't so much about showing how many clothes you had it was about quality of dress and using your clothes in different ways but also how your clothes were synonymous with with your figure and your person and your body and it's so much of certainly of austin's letters that we have are about how you alter clothing to keep it relevant and you need to think of regency dress as kind of by the time we get into sort of the 
I look at the Regency as sort of a long period of about 1795 to about sort of mid-1820s. And even what dress does in that changes within that period. But from about sort of the late 1800s into the 1810s, dress becomes more of you've kind of got a structure and then you've got its decoration and its trimming. So you're, you'd are you have sort of fewer gowns themselves, but then you'd make alterations to it, raising the waistline, adding flounces, changing the trimming, adding a new bit of ribbon here, adding bows here, and that kind of more, it's almost like the... Um, the foam on the top of the waves, you know, you've got the, the, the ocean that's your dress and then the waves keep moving. Um, or you might get, you know, new gloves or trim your bonnet differently or add a new kerchief. And all of these kind of accessories and ways to demonstrate your taste also were ways of kind of keeping up with fashion but making sure that making the most of this kind of this foundation structure that you had, which is your gown, and then also moving it up in hierarchy. So what used to be a really nice muslin evening gown, once it started getting a bit worn out, you might turn it into a petticoat or it became a visiting gown with a new flounce on the bottom to hide the dirty bit. And they kind of practice these hierarchies of value and uh, keeping up with what they could alter without having to go to the expense and time investment of a new a new piece of clothing. So there's a lot more discussion of that, certainly in Austin, but once you look at it and you look at women's account books as well, that's the kind of thing that they're buying. Ribbons are plenty. And so many ribbons, which they're using for all sorts of bits about their person, and they're a great way of achieving change and novelty and freshness, but at comparatively lesser expense. Yeah, that's actually what I want to come on to now is about um, sewing and um, needlework and making and mending and changing. Um, and we've got an audience question about this. So somebody asks about um, how how proficient at, at sewing would a sort of general generic Austin character be? I mean, if we take one at random, but if we think of Lizzie Bennet, um, you know, do you think she would have been making her own dresses or would she have just been sewing on ribbons? Um, they were all on average and Austin Heroine was entirely capable of making her own dresses and would have been definitely sewing, um, if not gowns, then all of the other bits of, of clothing, handkerchiefs and fichus and petticoats and things like that. The, the degree to which middle-class women made their own clothing is something that scholars are still investigating. So i am been looking at it, um, Serena Dyer has been looking at it and trying to sort of gauge how much women actually did because there's a whole lot of kind of complex and often contradictory information out there as well. And a lot of it is about um, fitting and also the size of the, the, the gowns. But it's also hard to tell from... Some of the, the references that are about they were making clothes. Well, are they making small baby clothes for the poor box? Are they making a little dispenser? Are they making simple petticoat? Is it simple pinafores that go over the top? It's kind of it's hard to unpick what they were actually doing. Um, there's Jane Austen certainly used mantua makers or dressmakers as the term became in this period. And if we look at people like say, uh, Harriet Smith in Emma, she has her gown made by someone else in the village. Now, she's, you know, not great in social status and she could sew her own, but she's still getting her gowns made out. But all of those skills about darning and mending and um, it's less of a problem in the Bennett's household, but making shirts for men and all of the kind of the chemises and the nightgowns and the night bonnets and all of these kind of linen-y, cottony things. It was linen slash cotton, women pretty much sewed it. So Lizzie Bennet is, she she works, as it's called. Anytime you see a reference to her, to someone working, it means needlework. And we distinguish between plain sewing and embroidery, but Lizzie definitely works. And in North Anger Abbey, um, Catherine Morland sews her brother's cravats um, and her mother chides her because she's kind of daydreaming about boys and she's like, well, Richard's never going to get his cravats done if you if you work like that. So there's even Mrs. Allen in North Anger Abbey who's clothes obsessed. She's one of the chattiest people about clothes in the whole of Austin. She, she works um, and 
often when women are sitting around in the in the drawing room, they are sewing communally. Um, there's a little bit of a distinction between what you sew or mend in the family and what you do when visitors are around. Austin's got a wonderful line where she talks about having been to someone's house and they were mending stockings in the drawing room when there was company there. And she says she dare not mention this at home to her mother, lest a warning prove an example. And her mum goes, that's a great idea. No, I'm going to mend stockings. And it's just like, I mean, nobody wants to mend your underwear in front of visitors. It's, it's that kind of thing. So sewing was a regular, normal and consistent part of middle class women's lives, which definitely includes the Austin heroines. Uh, whether or not they made their own clothes, if we take Austin as an example, she definitely altered them and may have made some of the smaller garments, but something like her silk pelisse was uh, professionally made. So it's kind of a, it's a range of practices that they engaged in, and I think it would depend on skill level, taste level, uh, the skill of your local maker, um, how much your income was and could afford, all of those kind of quite personal choices that we still make about how we get our clothes, although it tends not to be making so much these days. So we have um, clothes that are made at home, clothes that are made for you by a dressmaker. But there's a little mention in the book about how there are also some, there's the potential to buy things that are ready made. Um, and there's a question about that, sort of what the kind of balance of that would be. Would buying something ready made be expensive or would it actually be less good because it's not made bespoke for you? I mean, what was the kind of, how did that work? So there's slightly more ready-made stuff for men than for women. Um, and the things that tend to be sold ready-made for women are things that don't need fitting. So um, there, for example, Jane Austen buys a cloak in Alton. And of course, a cloak just goes around the shoulder. That could be, be bought ready-made. At another point much earlier, she complains that gowns aren't able to be bought ready-made. So it, I think, would depend where you go to. Obviously, if you go and buy, like, a beautiful cap from a London milliner, Austin was looking at the caps in Cranbourne Alley, which was just off Leicester Square, and hoped to be tempted. What you're kind of buying is, like, taste and fashion and that excitement of something that someone else has made. But then other things, um, if they are ready-made, often they're just made by outworkers at home. It's not quite as good quality. This is why it's, it's often done... It's often more for men who might not have access to women to sew for them and they just need shirts and they're just going to buy them from their tailor or, or a, a draper or an outfitter. So it tends to be, again, there's sort of a range of quality and you'd need to know where to shop. This is one of the concerns for Mrs Bennett um, when Lydia's getting married that she can't guide her through the London warehouses because you can imagine Lydia running a mock with money just going, I'm just going to buy this and this and this. She can't even be trusted to buy well in their village, you know, she buys a, a bonnet just because she may as well as not, and there were uglier ones there, and she's going to work it, you know, change it around. So this kind of sense of being guided as to what's quality, what will wear, like Henry Tilney understanding about muslin, it required a very haptic, tactile understanding of everything that went into um, a piece to be able for the consumer to judge whether it was good quality or not good quality, which would really depend on, you know, the maker, the supplier, and um, all of those sort of things about, you know, the, the nouse of shopping, understanding what it is that you're, that you're buying. But certainly Regency consumers had a much better material understanding of dress than we do now. I love that bit where Lydia buys her bonnet and she says, you know, oh, there were two or three much uglier in the shop. I will pull it to pieces and make it a better. And I'm always really intrigued by that idea. I mean, a bonnet to me seems something that would be harder to pull apart and put back together maybe than a dress would be. But do you think, I mean, was there that kind of skill as well at home? Like, would they be literally taking it apart? Did people make their own bonnets? I mean, that seems like a step up from dressmaking somehow. So it's it's actually it's actually much easier in a lot of ways. So certainly women made a lot of caps. So at home they'd often wear the sort of wear soft caps underneath and then underneath their bonnets as they went out. But yeah, trimming, re-trimming bonnets was like it's the easiest thing to do. Um, again, Lizzie Bennett does it in Pride and Prejudice. We don't notice it, but she's she's trimming a bonnet as well. And the often they had soft backs. So this kind of the big bonnet brim. Um, you could buy a straw bonnet sort of plain and then decorate it yourself or you could buy what was called a front which was like a cardboard brim or a straw brim 
and it's like it's sort of the basis of it and then you go up from there so you could add a soft crown if it was a sort of a high stiffened crown you're adding ribbons and you know fake fruits and flowers and feathers and all of these things that kind of mark your taste out so you've got this kind of bonnet block and then you retrim it you stitch on what you want you're always going to be stitching on the ribbons that go underneath so you can change it around and often they only just pin things on so you can then have the pink ribbon with your pink dress and the yellow ribbon with your yellow dress so there's the, the components of bonnets are very easily bought um, very easily acquired and to kind of take one apart and then reuse it is something that was done really commonly there's a great passage from one of Austin's letters where she describes her taking apart one of Cassandra's caps, I think a, a bonnet with a, a black velvet call, and she describes two or three different things that she does with it, and it's this kind of incredibly useful object that has worked for both sisters, and then one bit's been taken from here and they've added a bit here and she's used this bit to change there, and it was really common, that kind of headwear is a smaller a very visible marker of fashion and your ability to change that up was one of the places it's kind of really responsive quick fashionable change it's it's, it's the fast fashion of the regency period so well. you have a new bonnet every day if you really wanted to get in there with your needle yeah. bonnets are obviously oh, yeah. most synonymous with austin and with period dramas and i know that when people come to the museum and sadly not at the moment but normally people just love sort of trying what it's on and seeing how they change their look and it's kind of this instant way of sort of accessing something about Austin. Um, so we've actually we've nearly run out of time we've got time for one more um, audience question and this one is very niche but I know you're going to be able to handle it. Um, so we've got an, uh, someone who's written in and asked about the specific colour of puce and has said that you know this keeps on popping up in Austin and in things of the period. Um, and, and I know you talk about it a little bit in the book about different colors and things that perhaps we've sort of lost now. And I think puce, we've pretty much lost from our vocabulary now, but can you just tell us a little bit more about that and sort of what is that color and, and why has it gone from our vocabulary? Um, puce means flea in French. So when you go to the French flea market, you go to the Marché aux Puces. And so it was originally the kind of the dark reddy brown of a flea. And it's kind of, it, it then shifted to sort of be a more purple colour. And then in the colour vocabulary, um, my mother would tell me about it when she was wearing it in the 60s, it became, sort of became like a sort of a darker fuchsia. So it's on the violet, the, sort of the, the red violet colour range. Um, but it's again, it's one of those names like the 16th century kind of puce turd green, that when you get into it, it's, you know, puce is, it's flea colour. Um, but it does have this kind of reddish bloody undertone to it, you know, it's the flea what? soft blood. It's really soft. Yeah, and um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a purplish pink violet. Um, is, that's puce. And I mean, I think it's probably because, to be perfectly honest, it sounds like puke. Now. And, you know, so the, the associations of the word, we'd say fuchsia or magenta, or just use a different colour word for it, and it's, it's fallen out of favour, but we definitely still have the colour around. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, that has been a fantastic conversation and I'm sorry that we can't um, keep going all day, but we are going to cut to a really lovely bit of footage that we have, um, we've actually already filmed of Hilary in the drawing room at the house. Um, and she's going to be showing us the police, which she actually um, recreated from the only surviving piece of dress that is believed to have belonged to Jane Austen. Um, so I'm going to say thank you to you, Hilary, now, but we're not ending here. Stay with us to, um, to see the police sort of up close. So this is a replica of the original police belonging to Jane Austen, which is now kept in the collections of Hampshire Cultural Trust. And it's the original is the only known body garment that is thought to have belonged to Jane Austen. And it's got a really strong prominence as having done so. So I spent quite a lot of time with the original object and I measured it in every possible way, shape or form. And then I made a pattern and made a replica from it. So like the original, this is all completely hand stitched. Uh, seams and everything, and I used exactly the same colour thread as the original, which is uh, yellow. I don't know if you can just see, it's the same kind of bright yellow as the cord here. And it's made of a brown figured sarsenet, 
which is a star sign, it's a kind of fabric that was often used for the outer gowns of Regency women's dresses. And it's a twill weave, so it's got a little bit of body to it, um, and it means that the collar can stand up straight here with no stiffening inside. And the fact that it's figured means it's got a pattern on it. And in this case, it's a pattern of what's been described as oak leaves that runs down the length of the garment. And exactly like the original, this pattern is woven into the sarsenet, um, which was done by Gainsborough Silk Mills as a copy of the original. And the pelisse is lined in a white, much lighter weight silk. I used uh, habite silk, which would be very common to those of you who make historic costumes. But at the time, it would have been a slightly glossier, slightly looser weave silk that was called Persian. And her, Jane Austen mentions Persian a couple of times in her letters as something that she's buying to make clothes with. And the original is lined in that as well. So it's, I've added the belt back onto it. There's no belt on the original, but there's evidence on the inside that shows that there was once a belt there. And I based this on um, a piece that's in the Victorian Albert Museum in London that's of a very similar time. So it opens slightly unusually um, asymmetrically. So it comes from here on the collar, and then there's no fastenings down the front. So as you walk, the reason it's got this cord on both sides, it kind of would have opened up and shown the dress underneath. There's also no record on the original of how this was fastened. We tend to just put a pin or a brooch to hold it in place there. Um, but it's quite unusual that there's no evidence of that on the original. It's got long sleeves, and although they look quite simple, actually the cut of this is quite deceptively brilliant. And it took me about half a day to work it out very carefully with measuring grain lines and things. Uh, but what it does is it gives you um, an incredible seam line that runs, let me just turn this around, a seam line that runs from almost under the arm that swings around and comes to the bottom of the wrist and it's got shaping in it that means that the wearer can lift her arm up completely and also it's got room to bend her elbow. So although it looks like it's really close fitting and is perhaps tight, it's got more movement in it than any modern blazer or jacket that you might have in your wardrobe. It's also got this very distinctive kite-shaped back with these kind of dropped shoulders that means you get a really smooth line over here with no shoulder seam. And this kind of kite back was very common in the Regency period and it continues through into the later Georgian and Victorian period. The pelisse is cut in one piece all the way through. So under the back, there's no seam here and there's none of the side seams either. It's slightly more common that they were cut with a waist seam, which is seen on a lot of gowns, but this one is cut all the way through and then the shaping is done by a side piece here and little tucks in the back. To create the bulk at the seam, at the sleeve head here, it's pleated in uh, quite deeply. If you can just about see, the pleats are kind of irregular, and this exactly copies what was on the original. And when I was doing it, I realised it's because they're just put in by hand at about half inch intervals by eye. They're not regularly measured. So it was a great way of getting the sense of how the person who made it might have been approaching the task as well. Now, the original pelisse is dated stylistically to between about 1812 to 1814 which is exactly the period when Jane Austen is starting to earn some money from her writing. Unfortunately, we have I think only one letter from 1812, but we don't have many letters from this period that might have mentioned when she bought the fabric, um, this was hers, we assume it is, uh, mentioned it, but it's, silk was expensive. This would have been quite an investment purchase, and it does match the time when she maybe could have afforded that. But one of the ways that we can date it as well is by the depth and volume of the sleeve head. As we get sort of past the period of about 1810, Regency women's sleeve heads start getting puffier. They slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger until by about 1820, they're really becoming quite voluminous. So that slow increase of how much pleating there is, where that the, the pleating or the gathering sits can really help to date the fabric, as well, uh, date a garment as well. Another clue to the dating is the pattern. 
Now, quite unusually, there is a piece of cotton that is printed with an exact copy of this pattern, exactly the same scale, um, with brown, uh, sorry, yellow leaves on a brown striped background. And that is in a fashion magazine that is dated May 1812. So we know that this pattern, even if it wasn't in the silk, was certainly around in 1812 as well, which really contributes to the dating. There is also a fantastic fashion plate of about 1812 that shows a brown pelisse with this kind of puffed decoration used all the way around the uh, sleeve heads here and also all the way down the front of the garment. And when you compare that fashion plate, which is like the, the Vogue's eye view of fashion, with what's actually on this garment, it gives us an idea of the relationship between real clothing and fashionable clothing. So it's just a little bit less decorated. It's got the cord around the front and on the side, on the, the cuffs here, but it's just not quite so much effort as the fashion plate version. And I think it's a lovely insight into the relationship that Regency women might have had between what they wore and what they saw. So what else might make this Jane Austen's or what, what other evidence is there in this object for it having belonged to Austen herself? Uh, the pattern itself being an oak leaf has very patriotic associations at this time. Jane Austen had two brothers in the Navy and the oak leaf has been a symbol of naval might uh, since the 18th century. Their anthem is Hearts of Oak um, and the ships that were creating this extraordinary uh, martial dominance in the, the Napoleonic Wars were built out of oak and it was a symbol of sort of staunch Britishness. So it may have been a kind of a personal patriotic support of her brothers there as well. But one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for this having been Jane Austen's is its size. So Austen, um, we don't have great examples of her in images to sort of see maybe what her physicality looked like. But there's a lot that's written about it. She called herself a tall woman and there's lots of uh, various records from friends, relations, uh, people who knew her that generally describe her as very tall and thin. And this pelis, uh, which is about the right height for the wearer, it's for a quite a tall woman. It can be a little bit tricky to tell the length of the wearer from the length of the pelis because they came in a range of uh, lengths. They could stop at the knee, they could hit the ankle. But given how the proportions for this work, it probably was worn by a woman who was about five foot six, five foot seven feet tall. Now, according to skeletal records, the average height for a woman in the Regency was five foot two. So for a woman to be five foot seven, that's five inches over the average height and would have made her categorically a tall woman. It's also incredibly narrow around the shoulders. When I first made a um, template of this in calico, uh, Muslim the Americans, the, I was like, oh, I get to try on Jane Austen's jacket and I couldn't get my shoulders into it. I kind of got stuck. And it's really, really slim around the shoulders and around the bust. So when you actually look at the volume inside of this police, it is made for someone who in Regency terms is tall and was also quite thin. Now, plumpness was more admired as a style of beauty in the Regency period. The, the people who are put forward as beauties always have sort of rounder arms, rounder cheeks. And you get this sense reading descriptions of Jane Austen that no one can quite decide whether she was pretty or not uh, and how attractive she was. And it may have been that her physicality that is the still sort of held up now as the pinnacle of sort of fashion model style, long and lanky. It just wasn't the Regency idea of beauty. And this Pelissa's physicality um, really emphasises everything that we know about what Jane Austen looked like. The, also, the arms are very long, um, longer than they might be for someone of his height. And it gives also this impression of, of elongation and a quite sort of slightly lanky woman wearing this as well. So, I mean, there are other options. We don't know what Cassandra looked like. Uh, Jane Austen's beloved sister, she may have had a very similar physicality to Austen and this the, the garment this is a copy of could have been hers. 
We do know that Jane Austen had a silk police by at least 1814 because she writes in a letter to Cassandra asking her to send the police up to her in London as it might she might need it for a visit on the way home. But the way Austen phrases it tells us a lot about her wardrobe. She says, send my silk police. And if she had more than one, she would have had to qualify it with another adjective. She might have had to say, my blue silk pelisse, my velvet silk pelisse, but she only says my silk pelisse. So it suggests that she had, she had one, and it probably would have been quite a special item. What else is nice about this is it's kind of average. It's made of silk, but it's not too expensive as silk. It's got fashionable details, but it's not overly fashionable. The brown colour is known to be a colour that Jane Austen liked. We've got records of her buying brown dresses for herself or lengths of fabric to make a dress. So it's a kind of a, it's a good average colour. The length um, is suitable for most of the year round. And frankly, if I was going to make an investment purchase of a really nice coat, it's something that works in a lot of different social situations and is appropriate for a lot of, of times and places, which also fits quite well with what we know of how Austen's sort of more limited budget had to sort of work a bit more strategically and make her clothing go further. So all in all, lots of the evidence about the way this is cut, the way this is sewn, the fabric itself really does suggest that this was indeed Jane Austen's pillows. Thank you, Hilary. That was just so fascinating. And there's so much more in there. The, the book just is, um, is just so full of all of these different avenues that we could have gone down. We could have talked about this all day. Um, and it was really wonderful to have Hilary on site as well um, and to uh, for her to revisit the police which she made a couple of years ago and to really sort of explore that in some detail with us. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining Austin Wednesdays, the October edition. Um, we will be releasing some details on the next one in the coming weeks. So do keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll, um, we'll be releasing names and there'll be an opportunity to send in questions as well if you want to get involved that way um thank you from us again last little plea if you want to donate to the house we would appreciate that so much um we know that there is so much love coming to Jane Austen's house from all over the world at this difficult time and um we're just so grateful it's so wonderful to have uh messages and donations and well wishes good wishes coming in from all over the globe um, and visitors too, because actually we are still open. Um, obviously our numbers are reduced at the moment. There's lots of social distancing. There's an awful lot of cleaning going on in Chawton at the moment, but um, it's very safe. It's a rather wonderful time to visit actually. Um, it's very quiet. Numbers are really, you know, we're being kept really, really low. So it's it's a rather special, I think it's a really special time to come if you if you are, if you can, if you're close enough and you want to come and visit us, book your tickets online and come and see us. Um, and if not, then uh, join us in November for the next edition of Austin Wednesdays. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. <laughs>